Our feature presenter for this event is Michael Clark, a product line manager of Yokogawa's Communications and Optical Instruments. Michael holds a mechanical engineering degree from California State University, PICO, with a minor equivalent coursework in electrical engineering. Michael has over 18 years' experience related to test and measurement and over 14 years' experience specific to fiber optics. Additional experience includes mill aero data and acquisition systems, medical device manufacturing, passive micro-optics product development, and active network device te testing. Without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Michael. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. So, and thank you for the intro, Sophia. So, um, without any delay, I'm going to go ahead and get started here with uh, my uh, presentation. And uh, so, just a brief overview of the agenda. I'm going to try to keep it uh, relatively basic here, and just going to talk about a brief introduction of the company, uh, some OSA technology basics, and also um, you know, go over some sample applications of uh, how you could use an OSA and what type of industry and um, purposes it's uh, designed for. And I've also come up with a top ten list of uh, considerations, uh, uh, items that you may consider uh, if you are going to uh, evaluate an OSA in the near future. Or if you have an existing OSA and just like to know what the type of parameters um, that you currently have and uh, compare that with uh, newer units on the market today. And then, of course, I'll summarize everything towards the end. And um, I'm going to go ahead and start with the uh, introduction. For Yokogawa, um, Yokogawa was founded in 1915, so definitely have been around for many years, uh, close to a century now. Um, the first products that were uh, we introduced were actually electric meters. So as you can see there, there's a uh, old 1930 uh, era voltmeter that the Yokogawa made, and currently um, we have over. 18,000 employees worldwide, and uh, we have over $4 billion of uh, revenue. Uh, we have uh, local operations in 33 countries worldwide. And um, just uh, more specific to, since we have many divisions, you know, uh, more specific to the division that we're in is the optical test equipment market. And uh, as most of you have already known by now, uh, Yokogawa had acquired Ando, uh, the acquisition uh, was initiated in 2002, and uh, most people may recognize the name, uh, Ando being the leader in optical test equipment uh, design and innovation for also many years as well. Uh, I think they have over 80 years of history in, in this field. So the picture you see here um, is the uh, very popular uh, AQ6317 series OSA that um, many of you may have seen in the uh, labs and universities uh, worldwide. And uh, what I'd also like to do is just to cover a little bit of a timeline history of the different OSAs that, that we've introduced to the market. Now, this is condensed because there's been such a long history. I just want to highlight a few key points here. Um, back in 1980 is when uh, Ando Corporation introduced the first optical spectrum analyzer, that's the AQ1404. And over the years, we've introduced other models, but uh, probably the most popular models that uh, uh, on the market were the uh, in the 1990s during the telecom boom era, uh, the AQ6315 and, AQ, and followed by the AQ6317 series. So what's the um, since then, we have uh, updated, uh, in 2006, uh, we've uh, replaced the aging 6317 series OSA, uh, that's the telecom wavelength model, with the current platform as known as the AQ6370. And uh, starting in 2006, uh, once we introduce this next generation platform, we continued expanding on the capabilities um, over the past few years. And one year later, we introduced a long wavelength version that extended well beyond the telecom wavelength, uh, actually all the way up to uh, 2,400 nanometers. 
a very unique, and it's actually the only one in the world that offers this long wavelength capability. And uh, the year after that, we uh, waited for the, uh, we introduced the AQ6370B, which uh, had a number of improvements over the original AQ6370. And uh, in the past year, we introduced two models of the same telecom wavelength uh, version uh, as AQ6370C, which uh, replaced the B model. Only within the two years, we had added additional updates and made it faster. And we also introduced a uh, new, what I call it, affordable high-performance model, and that is the Dash 20 version. Okay. And in 2010, uh, also we introduced a uh, new visible wavelength model, 6373, which starts in the visible region down to 350 nanometers. So um, just a brief summary, um, as you can see, we have over 20 years of uh, experience with OSA, um, six new models in the past five years, which is the uh, Pretty, I think, a pretty impressive track record overall. Again, we have three models, three new models in 2010 alone. So we're definitely in the market, um, and uh, definitely plan to stay in the market for many years to come. Um, so I want to just talk about the very brief uh, optical technology basics and just to get a few things out of the way. Um, as you've probably all um, been uh, taught in the past. Uh, Make sure you always clean your connector tips before you uh, start uh, connecting anything to your equipment, to your test equipment. And, uh, um, and there's various ways to do that. Use a scope and make sure that the tips are clean, it's not dusty, oil-covered, or scratched. Um, we have instruments that uh, we also offer uh, that can connect to a USB probe, as you can see here, to actually view the image from the uh, fiber probe. And um, so that's important that uh, I'll mention that uh, I'll bring up this topic a little, a little bit later in the presentation. Um, another thing just to cover uh, quickly is the different fiber types that's on the market. Uh, obviously, uh, we, uh, the most popular one that we work with uh, in the telecommunications region is the single mode fiber okay, for long distance uh, high speed transmission. But then we still also have a number of uh, customers using multimode fiber in the 50 micron, 62 and a half micron uh, core sizes, as well as fibers in the uh, much larger core sizes as well. And uh, also want to uh, cover the uh, fundamentals of an OSA. So backing way back to the initial um, definition, uh, an OSA is uh, in the most fundamental form, a uh, uh, measurement provides a measurement of the distribution of optical power over the wavelength. So you have the optical power in the vertical axis, usually expressed in dpm or milliwatts, and you have your wavelength in the horizontal direction and usually expressed in nanometers or uh, in the hertz in frequency. So that's how you would sweep, usually in nanometer mode, you would sweep, it would sweep from left to right. You would put it in the terahertz mode, it actually sweeps from right to left. So it's a reciprocal function. Okay. And um, just to cover uh, who needs an OSA and what are some of the typical users of uh, OSAs. So um, a very popular uh, users for OSAs are component suppliers, um, people making laser diodes, LEDs, optical transceivers in the telecommunication space. And moving uh, up to that market, uh, those suppliers typically supply to equipment or system manufacturers. And this would be uh, network equipment manufacturers making a huge complex uh, telecommunications uh, network routers and switches, and uh, laser system manufacturers, uh, biotech systems, so a pretty broad uh, application in this field here. And uh, of course, they're moving up the ladder again, and we have uh, service providers that actually use that equipment to uh, 
get uh, provide service for us to uh, use the internet and uh, be able to watch uh, cable television. And uh, fiber optics is definitely very important for the high speed, uh, especially these days with video transfers, uh, and Netflix, and YouTube, and everything else on the internet. And of course, we also have a very large uh, uh, following with uh, universities and research labs. And uh, I'll point out the, one of the key reasons why um, our particular technology is uh, extremely popular for universities uh, applications. And uh, let's not forget the government agencies. Um, we all pay our taxes, so uh, uh, the government's got to figure a way to spend our tax money one way or the other. Uh, lots of uh, applications with uh, uh, government subcontractors, the aerospace industry. Okay. So all sorts of different, uh, very wide variety of applications for us. So um, next item I want to talk about is the fundamental operation of a monochromator. Uh, this, in this case, it, uh, we use a Turney Turner monochromator design in our OSA. And there's many other technologies out there, but we found this to be a uh, very reliable and uh, um, provides a very high performance um, uh, result for our OSA. So, um, starting with the input light. Uh, you would input the light into the monochromator, as you can see here uh, from uh, this uh, picture is shown as a white light, this is representing a broad spectrum of light going into the monochromator. It then reflects off a mirror and goes to a diffraction grating. So this the diffraction grating, what it does is it basically reflects the light into a rainbow spe spectrum, as you can see here. Okay. Um, sort of like a, a picture of a prism uh, uh, dispersing the light into a rainbow. This, this reflects the light into a rainbow spectrum. And uh, the spectrum gets uh, reflected into another mirror, and it gets um, transmitted to a uh, monochrome output slit, basically a very narrow slit that just allows for you to select the color of the light that you want to um, measure. So, um, and as the uh, diffraction grating rotates, is that's how you can select the different colors of light that's passing through the slit. So, by that definition, the word in itself, monochromator, mono meaning single, and the chromate, chrom is actually a, a word for color in Greek. So, uh, just the way it works, it selects one single color and to output into your sensor. And um, just a little trivia question, uh, trivia uh, fact for everyone. If uh, uh, you look at a, a CD or DVD and you shine a white light through there, it actually acts pretty much, very much like a grating because of the tiny little grooves on the CD, and it can actually reflect uh, the white light beam into a, a rainbow if you have a, a piece of white paper or a wall or something to shine a beam into from the, the reflected from the CD. So um, just to expand a bit more on the monochromator function, uh, this is a more detailed view of the uh, double pass monochromator that uh, uh, we typically use in our OSAs. So the light starts off coming in from your fiber input here, goes through a polarization scrambler, and it goes to a the first parallel beam mirror make the, the left light. And then it goes, reflects off the direct the fraction grating I talked about earlier. Splits the light into different colors, goes to another mirror, increasing the length of the beam travel here. And it goes off a you know, reflecting mirror, and the beam actually goes back okay. through the same set of mirrors except uh, when it bounces off the first mirror here, it actually goes through a slit okay, that I talked about as far as for selecting the color into the photo detector. Okay. And when 
and then again, and when the grating is turned, that's when we can select the color passing through that slit. So um, with that said, I'd like to cover a few sample applications for our OSAs. Um, just an overview to start with. Um, these are the OSAs that we offer with the uh, one on top here, the 6370 series. It's our most popular one. Uh, the general purpose uh, OSA with a general purpose wavelength from 600 to 1700 nanometers. Okay. And uh, in addition to that, we've, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the timeline history, we've added a long wavelength OSA and a short wavelength OSA, covering the visible region as well. So with that said, um, I want to talk about the different applications for the various types of wavelengths that uh, we can measure. So the first one, starting from the left to right, is the visible wavelength. Okay, so and uh, many devices are used to generate uh, uh, or pass through visible light. You know, we have the DPSS uh, lasers, laser diode packages, butterfly packages mounted on, on a PC board. Um, we have uh, fiber lasers, okay, um, and then some, a lot of this pass through uh, are used for fiber rack ratings. Uh, and then, of course, we have the fluorescent filters used to filter out various parts of uh, visible light. So um, these devices are uh, commonly used in a number of applications, including the medical for laser therapy, OCT, uh, blood oxygen sensing, um, the biotech industry for fluorescent uh, microscopy. Sorry, and uh, um, that uh, was a very popular application for one of our customers and. Uh, this customer purchased multiple units for this application uh, in the visible region. Um, also have uh, applications in the industrial sector for laser micro machining, uh, even laser markers, and uh, even the telecom region uses visible light with the POF, plastic optical fibers. Um, and then we have uh, some uh, free space type application using LIDAR for distance sensing, uh, distance ranging. Okay. Um, and also a um, number of applications in the uh, home electronics market, too, for visible light. Laser printers, um, LED products, display. Um, people are using uh, uh, the red, blue, green uh, lasers to uh, um, gen uh, generate the micro displays now. Very new and exciting market for us. The next one I want to cover is the uh, general purpose band OSA. And again, this is our most popular model um, because of the telecom applications uh, in the telecom space. Uh, people uh, use this for many years for uh, optical uh, active devices as well as passive devices. Uh, and active devices, uh, fiber lasers, amplifiers, optical transceivers, really popular for that application. Um, for the passive devices, we have filters, the fiber bright gratings, rotoms, okay, and even the fiber itself. People use OSAs to actually make sure that the fiber is transmitting the wavelength that they really need. Um, in addition, on the larger scale, we have the optical transmission equipment for the DWM, dense wavelength division multiplexing, and coarse wavelength division multiplexing uh, application. I'll talk a little more about that in the next few slides. And um, again, the industry uh, that uh, this would apply to with the um, TFE laser manufacturers, Vixels, a tunable laser, of course, very important for people to uh, verify the tunable lasers are uh, outputting the correct wavelength. Uh, super containing lasers, a very broad range there, and uh, um, as well as fiber component manufacturers, and again, the R&D labs and universities um, really uh, love using the, this type of wavelength OSA just because it's such a general purpose application. And the um, last one we want to cover is the long wavelength model. And this, by long wavelength, I mean the light that's uh, beyond the 1700 nanometer range, uh, which is the typical telecom band that ends there. And, um, 
up until uh, we introduced this model, there really wasn't anything on the market in this um, class uh, with the type of uh, instrument to measure the long wavelength light. So it's been extremely popular since we, we introduced this. Um, one of the really popular applications for this is gas sensing. So and I'll talk more about that in the next few slides. Um, uh, for example, CO2 gas, uh, there's a uh, optical spectrum or signature of CO2 gas is around the 2 micron region. So that's what you can't measure that with a standard general purpose wavelength OSA. And by uh, measuring the gases, uh, we want to make sure we understand what's in the atmosphere, um, what's causing climate change. Um, in addition, there's medical, biomedical applications, and again, also some uh, telecom applications as well for free space communication. And there's uh, pretty much similar group of uh, industry that uh, would use this, except they were using it in a longer wavelength region. So as I mentioned, there's uh, in the laser company, super continuum lasers, especially since that's one of the few uh, broadband lasers that uh, can extend beyond the telecom band. The two micron or even longer still. So, um, just a few more details on the applications. Uh, first, starting with the visible light, uh, you can use our 6373 OSA to measure a white uh, visible light spectrum here. And uh, built into this uh, OSA, there's actually color analysis features which gives you the uh, dominant wavelength as well as the XYZ coordinate of the uh, chromatic properties in this uh, form. There's an industry standard uh, method for measuring uh, visible light and uh, been very useful and handy since this is a built-in feature into the instrument. Um, next item, um, this is involving the telecom. Uh, and OSA, and for most of you are uh, probably familiar with the WDM uh, application here, where you have uh, multiple wavelengths of light getting mucked into a single fiber, and you have multiple wavelengths going through that fiber, getting um, amplified, going through a rotom network, and selecting different wavelengths to uh, route the traffic, and going back to a DMUX system. Your wavelength. So, um, because it's such a popular application, uh, we developed a number of dedicated analysis functions for this. And we actually have uh, over uh, actually 13 built in analysis functions. So, one of them is dedicated for this uh, WDAM analysis. And here's what it looks like basically, if you connect the OSA into the network where you have all the MUX wavelengths. And you want to look at all the wavelengths, but you want to know all the properties of that uh, network uh, with respect to the wavelength um, uh, span, the spacing, uh, the levels of each channel. Um, this is all built in and it's done in real time. So as you're measuring this product, this uh, signal, uh, you're seeing the uh, uh, change and if there's any change uh, dynamically uh, with all these channels. And it's very fast too, and and this is all updated in real time. And you can see the one really important parameter is the signal to noise ratio, the OSNR. That's all calculated for uh, the customer. Extremely popular and useful. Probably our most popular application, uh, one of the most popular applications for this analysis routine. Um, and another one uh, covering the uh, longer wavelength application is the gas sensing I mentioned earlier. So um, one uh, application here would be uh, you're actually using this to measure the column density of, uh, uh, for example, here is a methane gas. So different types of gases have different um, signatures per se. So this spectrum is representative to a specific type of gas. And by measuring uh, shining light through a medium, in this case, an uh, autoguider uh, uh, containing this gas, 
and connecting that into the instrument, into the OSA, you can actually see the spectrum and determine what types of gases are contained inside this gas chamber. Okay, so application would be for environmental management, energy, um, satellite power and gas. So um, next item I want to cover is uh, put together a top 10 checklist of uh, things you might want to look for when you're considering an OSA. Okay, so starting at the top, we have a wavelength range. Obviously, I talked about that already. That's, of course, very important. And resolution is also very important. Accuracy as well, level of sensitivity, dynamic range, sweep speed, and these are all performance considerations. But there's also other considerations, of course, that people are always concerned uh, with cost, value, optical interface, what type of fibers, and uh, um, interface uh, the instrument can accept. The operational interface, you're using this every day, you want to make sure it's user-friendly and easy to learn, okay? especially for uh, labs and universities where you have uh, new students coming in and out every year. Um, Long-term reliability, of course, uh, is an uh, investment into a uh, piece of capital equipment. You want to make sure it's very reliable and uh, there's very um, stable long-term support available for the unit. Okay, so I'll go over each one of these items in more detail. Um, again, starting with the wavelength range, as I mentioned before, we have three models covering wavelength range from 350, the down and visible, up to 2.4 microns. And wavelength resolution, so that's the second item I put on the list. Um, wavelength resolution is defined as the full width half max of a line spectrum. So you have your line spectrum here. So you go 3 dB down and look at the uh, resolution width. And that, that's how it's defined. And it's controlled by the width of the slit. As you may recall, I talked about the construction of the OSA, and there's a output slit built into the unit. Okay, so, so this is the diffraction grading, again, reflecting the light into a rainbow pattern, and you're selecting a very narrow uh, passage for this particular color. But uh, if you increase the slit width here, you're expect, uh, accepting or passing through a much larger area uh, or, or width of that beam. And this gives you a little better idea what physically what um, how that's done. Uh, inside the unit, there is actually a rotating wheel with multiple windows. And this is one sample design to, for this type of a method. So again, the optical resolution is defined by the width of the slit. This is a slit plate that rotates. So the wider the slit, the lower the resolution. And you can keep rotating this wheel to select a narrower and narrower slit. And basically, the resolution is affected by three factors. The input slit, the diffraction grading itself, okay, the way that the light is being reflected, and the output slit. And uh, again, when the resolution is increased, for example, from 0.5 nanometers to 0.1 nanometers, you need to use a, you need to use a smaller slit to align that with the optical sensor to select your resolution. So we have a very reliable way to do this and it's been proven to be uh, very effective using this method. Uh, so, and as a result, our 6370 OSA offers a best-in-class resolution of 20 picometers. Okay. There are other OSAs that offer better resolutions, but for the class in itself, um, and we, we think it's a very uh, um, perfect combination of uh, cost versus performance in this case. There's other, as I said, the other uh, units on the market that can give you much better resolution, but it's at two or three or four times the cost. Usually, uh, sometimes some models are over six uh, figures in cost. Um, next item I want to talk about is wavelength accuracy. So, 
one of the thing, ways that uh, we ensure that our OSA stays uh, active over time is uh, we offer a standard built-in calibration light source. Okay? And uh, it's very easy to do uh, this calibration. All you basically need to do is connect the fiber from the output of the light source and into the input of the unit, and you press two buttons on the system, and you press the soft button here to start the process. Does the optical alignment and wavelength calibration at, uh, right after the other? And what is it doing when you're doing this calibration? This gives you a much better idea. Inside the unit, the internal calibration source is basically an LED, a broad spectrum LED, that's passing through an acetylene gas absorption cell. So the reason why we're using this acetylene gas cell is it has a uh, it's natural product that has an accuracy of plus or minus 0.6 picometer. Okay, so it's very stable, very reliable reference uh, accuracy source. So the spectrum will look something like this. You've got multiple uh, notches. And what we do is basically take one cow point, one notch, in this case uh, around uh, that 1530.3714, and it shifts the alignment table inside the OSA to align to this notch. So um, you'd want to do some uh, this uh, alignment. We recommend doing it once a week after you warm the instrument. That's just a way to ensure that uh, you're getting the most accurate result from your instrument. And uh, we've actually talked to people that have owned uh, our unit for many years, and they've never done this. They just send it in once a year, and they never notice an issue. So, um, yeah, and you have different mix of uh, different people using this into different degrees. But it's built in, and it's at no cost to the customer. So, in summary, our uh, 6370 COSA offers a best-in-class accuracy of 20 people here. Again, a very impressive number and usually uh, um, very sufficient for most applications. And the uh, next item is the sensitivity. So talking uh, more specifically, uh, the sensitivity is defined by the uh, power that it's able to measure. And we offer multiple settings uh, as a uh, way for the customer to optimize sweep speed versus the sensitivity desired or required. And we offer up to a minus 90 dBm sensitivity, which again is the best in class. So that's a minus 90 dBm is a very, very low power and it's able to measure down to that level. And next item is the dynamic range. So why should you care about the dynamic range? Dynamic range is defined here as a uh, way to see a true shape of an actual spectrum. So here's your sample spectrum. Okay, that's your actual spectrum. When you measure it with an OSA, depending on the dynamic range spec, you're going to get a wider measurement than the actual width of the instrument. You're measuring the peak accurately, but as you increase the dynamic range, the higher the dynamic range, the more closer in you're going to be able to measure that spectrum. Okay. So here's an example of where you may have a, a two peaks and represented by the blue. This is your actual spectrum. And based on the dyna dynamic range performance of your OSA, uh, you're going to capture a much better um, shape of the waveform with a high dynamic range OSA. So, for example, you're going to miss this valley here if you don't have a high dynamic range instrument. So, uh, again, to summarize the dynamic range of our most current uh, uh, 637C model is uh, up to 78 dB typical. And that's defined by the distance from the peak wavelength to the left and to the right in nanometers. So as you can see, the, the uh, narrower it goes, the narrower the, the width, the lower the dynamic range spec is. As you go further out, 
then you have increased dynamic range spec. So we offer up to a 78 dB, which is again the first, the best in class for this type of instrument. And the next item is the super speed, and that's important for a lot of reasons. One thing we've improved on is the sweep speed of our current generation OSA by a number of factors. This is an example of a previous generation OSA, and as it's sweeping, it actually stops and makes pauses. And the reason for that is because it's doing a game change within the instrument. So in comparison, a current generation OSA doesn't do that at all. It's called seamless sweep. As you can see, this is simulated, but basically this is how it's going to appear on the instrument. And it's going to just sweep seamlessly. It's still doing the game change, okay, inside, but it's just so much faster because of the current uh, technology with the processors. And we've also uh, improved on the electrical amplifier circuit to offer this seamless sweep speed. So as a result, it's over 10 times faster than the previous generation OSA. And the cost and value. So just, uh, you know, just in the past uh, years, we've talked to people, and there's been a number of misconceptions you want to get out in the open. Um, one of the misconceptions is new OSAs are very expensive. They started over $40,000. And, and this was true. This was true actually back uh, during the Clinton era, about 10 years ago, uh, when telecom boom was at its peak, uh, many OSAs were over $40,000. $40, That's no longer true today. Um, we've uh, improved on the manufacturing processes, um, offering much more affordable units, and actually it's more affordable and has better performance than the past. Um, and uh, it's, it's actually true. There are manufacturers that still offer uh, OSAs at over $40,000 in the same class, but uh, not true here at Yoko Bauer. The other misconception is uh, you can still buy an OSA for less than $10,000 because there's so many excess units on the market. Um, you know, over the past few years, supply and demand has shifted, and uh, that's driving up the cost of used OSAs. And also, a lot of the used ones have, you know, they're just so old that the, they just uh, um, are no longer feasible to, uh, or practical to maintain and keep. And uh, just the, uh, not too long ago, early this week, I just saw one unit on the eBay for over $23,000, which is uh, considerably expensive for the age of the unit. It's over 10 years old. Another thing you want to consider is carefully, carefully weigh the true cost versus performance factors. So you want to look at the value of what you're getting, go through the checklist that I've talked about, and uh, really compare the result of what you're getting for your money. We do have uh, tools to help people um, compare uh, the uh, different OSA technologies or models on the market. Um, including uh, not only just uh, between our model and the other models on the market as well. And um, um, just unbiased comparisons of the technical data. And just to help you stop, to summarize on one page, just to help people look at the list and compare and make a decision on their own. Okay. And uh, again, this is uh, emphasizing the uh, cost versus value of uh, OSA. So, there's many uh, telecom boom era OSAs uh, that were on the market or you may have already in the lab and uh, you want to consider, you know, why should you upgrade to a new OSA? So um, if you are shopping for one, then there's questionable availability, as I mentioned earlier. There are very few and far in between nowadays. Um, sometimes they're advertised, but they don't really actually exist. Um, and most of them were over 10 years old because they were from the telecom era. And there's also parts of obsolescence concerns with the older generation models that were built over a decade ago. They just simply cannot uh, find parts, especially processors and chips that were used. Um, a lot of them have short or no warranty. Um, and, uh, of course, the speed and performance just can't compare with the current designs today. And 
one last thing is uh, related to cost is you should consider um, what's the lifetime of a uh, OSA um, that's been that was introduced 10 years ago or 12 years ago. Um, look at the estimated product life or something. Let's just you know I can't say or guarantee anything like this, but if you just use a number like a 15 year product life and you look at a looking at a 12 year old OSA, you have three years of life remaining. If something goes wrong due to parts of the you may or may not be able to repair that back to its original spec. So if you're spending over twenty thousand dollars, you're looking at about seven thousand dollars a year versus a new instrument which would presumably last you fifteen plus years and the overall cost per year it just really can't compare. We're looking looking at the I'll say two thousand a year over the lifespan versus seven thousand a year, okay, more than triple the difference in terms of that annual cost. And um, optical interface, that's the item number eight on my list. So you've seen this before. One of the key um, differentiators that we offer is a free space optical input. And it's truly, most instruments have a connector on the inside of the uh, instrument. So it's a connector to connect the interface. So what that means is you would only be able to use a single mode fiber with a single mode instrument or a multi mode fiber with a multi mode instrument. It's the core set the match in order to give you the uh, best power coupling. So this three space design allows you to use both single mode and multi mode fibers. In addition, it's truly three space. There's actually no, nothing there to clean. So that's the key concern as I mentioned earlier is you want to make sure that the connector tips are clean because you don't want to damage or scratch the connector on the instrument itself. So this, in this case, it's worry-free. There's nothing to scratch on the inside of the instrument. So you know, this is one of the reasons why um, this design is very popular with universities where sometimes you're not always able to control um, the uh, users um, and uh, how well the uh, input connector is clean and inspect it before it's plugged into the instrument. So once you scratch up the instrument, uh, a lot of times you have to send it back to the manufacturer and have them take weeks and weeks to replace or repair or repolish the connector on the inside of the instrument. So I'm going to go off on the tangent slightly, uh, talk about testing multi-mode fibers. Um, this is the free space input, again, uh, shown in a large view, in large view. And this is an example of the numerical aperture coming out of a uh, fiber. And so once you send the light into the uh, free space input, you're going to get, it's going to come out in a cone-shaped pattern. So for testing multi-mode fibers, um, I'm going to go right to the slide here just for testing some time. For testing multi-mode fibers, uh, traditionally, the input set of the OSA uh, blocks uh, much of the beam because of the numerical aperture being much larger than a single mode fiber. So this is a multi mode fiber here, and usually the NA of that is about 0.2. With a uh, single mode fiber, you don't have to worry about that. Okay? The input set is optimized for a single mode uh, NA of 0.1. So in order to get the maximum amount of light into the instrument, we offer a NA conversion adapter, which basically reduces the NA numerical aperture down to about half. So therefore, you're getting the majority of the light into the instrument, so you're not sacrificing the uh, power getting transferred into the unit. So other manufacturers uh, have a, as high as 14 dB of uh, power a penalty when they're using a multi-mode fiber, whereas in this case we offer a solution that allows you to basically send all the light into the instrument, which gives you a better dynamic uh, range overall. An example of the light um, going in directly and with the adapter, getting about 5 dB gain in optical power. And also better level stability direct input, you see some fluctuation here. With the adapter, you see very stable power output, and as well as 
with the adapter, you see a much smoother trace versus a uh, more, much more jagged ripple on your uh, output because of your modes. A lot of your modes are not getting passed through the slit if you don't have the uh, narrow numerical aperture. Um, one of the last things uh, is operational interface. A um, couple things you want to consider in an instrument, of course. You're going to be using this every day, and uh, depending on your application, um, you may be sitting in front of an instrument, and if you're not familiar with the menu system, we offer a mouse-driven GUI. allows you to point and click on the screen button. You can do a zoom in with your trace, click on the corners of your trace and zoom in. And also, um, we kept the same button menu as the previous generation uh, and the OS 8, which if many people are familiar with that. We offer the same menu system. And some people don't use the instrument at all uh, by the front panel. Some people use the instrument for remote control only. And we now offer Ethernet control as well as the traditional TTIP and serial port control of the OS 8. Um, we also offer a multiple command set capability with the current Skippy command and, and as well as the traditional ANDO command set. So if you have units that have, were written with the uh, older code, you don't have to worry about rewriting the code. We also offer lab view drivers, free online, um, a re very neat remote viewer application software also is available where you can connect that your instrument to a PC remotely through the LAN port and you can actually do real-time uh, measurements of the OSA remotely. So as long as you have a LAN connection and you're logged into the instrument, you can basically drive the instruments from your PC wherever you may be at and as if you were there in real-time, collecting the data in real-time, you can actually transfer files back and forth. So extremely uh, popular for people that may have manufacturing overseas and uh, engineering in the States, and they can actually drive the instrument overseas and do analysis with, uh, remotely without having to be there. Um, checklist summary. So the top ten items talk about the wavelength range. I covered uh, the different ranges we offer for visible to uh, up to over two micron. Um, the resolution. You want to consider the resolution in the test span as well as the full span of the instrument. Accuracy, uh, we offer as, uh, accuracy as uh, high as 10 picometer in some cases. And of course, we have the self cal feature that assures that the instrument is accurate over time. We have a very high minus 90 dBm level sensitivity, very high uh, best in class dynamic range of 78 dB, multiple optical interface options, multi mode, single mode, even large core size, which I didn't talk about can actually accept up to 800 micron core size on some of the instruments. Uh, sweep speed, 10 times faster um, than the previous generation model. Uh, cost versus uh, value. Uh, we need to take a close look at that. The operational interface uh, for mouse driven GUI. And long term reliability support. That's something that I want to cover real quickly. For the reliability part, um, we have, I, I feel, a very strong uh, brand track record. Our instruments are, have been out in the field for many, many years are still running strong. Um, and corporate longevity. So we've been around for over 90 years, so we plan to be around for many, many years moving forward, so we don't have to worry about the, uh, not having support for the instruments. So, with that said, um, I just want to review quickly the different uh, fiber optic communications or the different reference wall posters that uh, we like to offer as a complimentary copy for everyone for attending. Um, we have two different types of posters, one dedicated for fiber optic communication and one is a light map poster. So, um, just to give you an idea, I know you can't see it very well, the uh, fiber optic communication poster gives you reference information for general information like connector type, the different EWDM grid wavelengths, and uh, some
summary of the uh, network components, um, the different wavelength transmission windows, different types of fiber, uh, backscatter properties, a main cause of the fiber loss. So really useful, handy reference. Even has a section that talks about OTDR measurements, other additional reference tables. And then the light map poster is very different. It basically covers the span from visible 350 up to uh, 2.4 micron. And it talks about the different types of lasers uh, in this region. So very popular for people in the R&D environment to say, as a reference wall poster. So we're going to offer this to uh, everyone that's attended uh, this class or this uh, webinar. Um, we'll be sending out an email, follow-up email, and uh, you can respond to us uh, with uh, to confirm your address and confirm which one of you know, the two or both posters if you'd like to have us send you both of them. Um, so that concludes my webinar. Um, this is my contact info. This will be on the uh, uh, PDF copy of the slides that we'll be sending out shortly. So thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you, Michael, for a wonderful presentation. We've run out of time for our Q&A section. Please be assured that if you submit a question, they will be answered via email. Also, if you have not yet answered the poll questions, I request you to please do so at this time. With that, I'd like to once again thank you all for attending and participating. We hope to see you online at our future web seminars.